Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is another one of my favorite guests from the UK, Alex Wynn Stanley, and he has written a children's book called My Grandma Has Dementia. So thanks for joining me, Alex. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So tell us about you, your grandma, how you came to write the book. Let's just hear all about you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I guess myself, I'm um, a teacher as well as a carer for, for young disabled adults. Um, so I do a lot of work around disability and social inclusion and disability awareness. Uh, so I've always had a very person-centered, inclusive mindset um, and it had always been in the back of my mind to write a book around dementia because my grandma has lived with dementia for, for quite a while. And um, I had always wanted to write a children's book to try and explain it to children because growing up, I always had some questions like why was my grandma forgetting things or why was she repeating things a lot and what, why was she taking medication from certain boxes at different times? These sort of questions always sort of was in my head and I wanted to try and explain those for children. At the same time, I know there's a lot of research out there to show that children uh, of, of grandparents or family members living with dementia uh, can often get some anxieties or stress around that, as well as for myself growing up watching my mum um, care for my grandma constantly all the time and the stress that that brought. Um, and, and yeah, my grandma lived with us for a year or so at one point and the stress that that brought. And it's just all these things I thought, well, if children can be aware of that, from an early age and understand it a little bit more and empathize with, with the impact of dementia uh, on an individual and a family, then it would, it would help. So with those anxieties. So yeah, that's why I wanted to, to do the book. That makes sense. I think our separation of generations, you know, young people moving away for, for jobs and then marrying and having families. I don't think that really helps because then you go back, and you've probably experienced this a little bit. You go back, you're visiting grandma and she's confused. She doesn't remember who you are. She's asking you weird questions. She thinks you're her husband. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. that's, you know, when you're a younger person, that's, it's hard to deal with as like a teenager or a young adult, but as a child, yeah. you know, that's, it's scary. And we need to, like you said, you know, help them be more comfortable with that. So I, I yeah, applaud sure. you. There's a lot more kids books coming, but you're definitely, you're definitely ahead of the curve a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, that's good. It's good to hear. No, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, At least as far I mean, as I'm aware anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, me too. I mean, I looked into it and I, there, there's some dementia books out there and, and stuff. Um, I just thought there's not too many uh, real child friendly picture books. And this book uh, has been illustrated in such a way that, I actually think without the words, you know, um, children would understand what, what's going on. And, you know, the illustrations are fantastic in explaining that. And I guess I can go into some detail with that. But, um, but yeah, for example, I got a message from a parent at the weekend uh, of a two-year-old who said, you know, I've read, I've ordered your book, I've read it. And here's my son, Arlo, who's two. And uh, we read it together because my dad has uh, early onset dementia. And she said, it, it's fantastic. And, he, and it, I couldn't believe it. It was two year old with this book. I was like, I didn't, I, I mean, it's sort of aimed at sort of year, four years old through to 10 years old ish, that sort of age. And in, in England, that would be like primary school age. Um, but that's the aim. And then, yeah, it's like two year old. And, I, and then I got a message today from some, from a family in San Francisco <laughs> and their, their daughter's uh, 13 and they were reading the book and I was like, so yeah. It is quite the age span and San Francisco is, well, it's almost a foreign country. I've not been there in so long, thanks to COVID, <laughs> Yeah, but it's only about an hour, hour and 15 minute. It's, it's 50 miles Southwest of me. Yeah. We're Northeast. So yeah, you know, that's not terribly far, about an hour, hour and 15 on the train, more or less depending on traffic if you drive. So yeah. I'm hoping to get to see it again soon. <laughs> yeah, me, me too, me too. I've been a couple of times and I'd like to be back there, to be honest. Like you say, just to be traveling. 
Oh, that's that's why we escaped to Tahoe City this past weekend because it's like I I am tired of looking at the same view and the same yeah. trails and roads and yeah. I love my hometown but holy moly I'm <laughs> I'm over yeah, it. Me, me too, but imagine that but with cold, dark, snowy, wintry weather and it goes dark at 4 p.m. and doesn't get light until 8 p.m. So yeah. 8 a.m. you mean? Uh, 8 a.m. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh wow, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. And we're totally diverging just a little bit, but I'm sure you guys are feeling the same way we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We let's see. It gets light about seven ish and dark about five thirty. So we got we got sounds like about two and a half hours on you. Yeah, <laughs> and nicer that's, weather. Yeah. Well, it's California, so <laughs> can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long did your grandma? live with dementia i know she recently passed away yeah we're all sorry about that we're we're yeah, sorry no, for your you. loss but we're glad that her her difficult journey is over yeah definitely and we were very very lucky with my grandma i mean just to diverse slightly but like yeah very very lucky um you know she passed away really peacefully at the in the care home where she lived and they were amazing um and i'll talk about care homes possibly in a little bit but um, they were absolutely fantastic with her. We were so lucky. Uh, my mum got to be there after having like COVID tests and uh, masks and everything, all the precautions. So it was really nice um, in a way. And yeah, um, we were really lucky. She she didn't get to the stage where she was um, suffering too much or anything like that. So yeah, really lucky. And and I think the biggest thing is that this book now, as many people have told me, that that is her legacy and. And it, someone said to me a couple of days ago, your grandma's now immortalized. And I was like, wow. And, and I hadn't thought about it until people started sending me messages over the week. And now the book is on Amazon. And after the, a week of it being on, people are sending me these messages with the book. And I'm like, they're seeing my grandma. They're seeing my grandma in the back of the book on the tribute page because there's a, a lovely tribute page at the back where um, it's a picture of my grandma with a newspaper article, a local newspaper article uh, about the book before it was released, just before she passed. And um, and then the, the sort of illustration version next to her. And the illustrator's done an amazing job. Um, it's, and then it's, underneath that is a poem that I wrote for her funeral that I read at her funeral. And yeah, I've, I've not been able to read it again yet, <laughs> but I'll get there. Uh, but yeah, no, um, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Um, but, but yeah, my grandma lived with, dementia for around sort of 10 years that she had the diagnosis of, of mixed dementia and um yeah it, it was probably before that as well but yeah the diagnosis was was around sort of 10 10 years before she passed and they seem to live what i've read is two to ten years from diagnosis mm -hmm. which i thought was interesting because my mom was diagnosed about mid mid stage like mm -hmm. middle of the mid stage if you chop it into three chunks, which is hard to visualize maybe. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure she would have lived if she hadn't fallen and broken her leg. She would have lived, I think a couple more years. I could be wrong. She did seem to be withdrawing inside, which I now know is more a sign that she's starting the transition. Right. So it's hard to know, but it's, yeah. it's interesting that the, the general consensus is two to 10 years from diagnosis. She was diagnosed September, 2011, passed away March 31st, 2020. So right. yeah, it's a little insane, but we knew long before that when she was finally diagnosed was like, yeah, tell us something we didn't already know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know that there's, as you, you know, you'll agree there's a grieving process anyway. It's, you know, as much as you don't want to lose that person, you, you almost start to lose them as the time goes on. Uh, in different ways uh, as I said the last two years of my grandma's life were two of her best years um, she went from living on her own with very little a very sedentary lifestyle very little stimulation uh, and we thought that was the best for her because she was comfortable and safe or well not safe once she started to fall but safe sort of in her in her mind and then she lived with us for, for a year and and she was safe and comfortable again and, and we were really pleased about that but we realized that we were actually not doing her any favors. We were, we were killing her with kindness. That's what my mom always says. Yeah. She's so she, when she went to Windsor house, which is a local, a local care home, it was terrifying. Um, and I was really scared. And there was, there was, there's such terrible media reports about care homes and rightly so there's some horrendous care homes, horrendous care. And it makes me feel sick. But, um, 
my grandma's care home the last two years of her life. I actually think it took years off her. I think I agree that I actually think my grandma could have also lived slightly longer. Um, and she, she looked years younger at times in some of the photos they were sending and the activities they were doing. And uh, I actually think she could have, if, if it weren't for, the, it, it was almost just a water infection that her body just sort of gave up. But uh, yeah, we were really lucky, really lucky. Yeah, I feel the same way. My mom's care residence was amazing. Yeah. And I always considered the the care staff and myself to be part of mom's team. So I didn't go for visits with mom and ask them to do things or can you get me this or mom needs that. Mm -hmm. I was there. I took care of stuff and they always knew they could rely on me. It was kind of always a joke because I would go, I'd pick my mom up. We'd go to the park and we'd watch kids or we'd go to the library when we had our, you know, our Northern California version of bad weather. (laughs) (laughs) And I swear they always asked me, on the, when, as I was bringing her back, oh, your mama needs more of this or your mama needs more of that. I'm like, you couldn't have said that on the outside trip because now I got to go back out and go yeah. down to the, you know, the store and get whatever it is you told me she needed and come back again. <laughs> I was like, but I always did it because one, it was, it was either then or they'd have to wait another week and that wasn't acceptable. Right. But the the funniest day that I went and visited I show up and they're like, oh, your your mom's not here. And I was like, excuse me, like, where'd she go? <laughs> you no, know, it's a lock-in community. Yeah. You know, I knew my sister was at work. I'm like, what'd she do? Hitchhike out of here? And they're yeah. like, oh, she's on the bus. I guess they had a, a weekly bus trip. I don't know what they did. Drove around town. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, we got some nice places to look at, but it's it's not a touristy town by any means. Yeah. Normally they would go on Wednesdays, but something was happening that week. And so they shifted it to Monday. And I was like, I never knew she went on these bus trips. She's <laughs> not really super cooperative with me. Yeah. So I was really surprised, but she had friends in the care home. Yeah. Many of the listeners know that there was my mom who was Diane. There was other Diane. And then there was other, other Diane. So at one point <laughs> there's three ladies with Alzheimer's together friends they were like the three three musketeers all named diane which was confusing for those of us that don't have problems with our mind yeah, exactly i was gonna say that i'm sure that wasn't confusing <laughs> yeah well and you'd say i'd say you know hey where's your friend diane well, i'm diane i know you're diane but the other diane it was just like <laughs> it was it it was like, you couldn't even yeah. bother and it, it, yeah. it was funny but you yeah. were talking about kind of the the early grief process, my mom thought I was her best friend. So right. when she referred to her husband, especially when she referred to him as kind of a sarcastic, like, why isn't he taking care of this? Like, oh, because he's yeah. gone. I never yeah. reminded her that he had died because that was yeah. obviously not going to be nice. But it was yeah. hard sometimes. It's like, man, it'd be really nice if I could just answer you that dad this or dad that or whatever. But nope, if I said, She'd always ask me, does my husband know where I'm going? Yes. Yeah. Dad knows where you're going. That never answered her question. So it it, it was weird. And yeah. there were many times I would say on the podcast to my friends, I'm ready for this journey to be over. And then when yeah. it was over, it was like, oh, I guess I wasn't as ready as I thought. So it is yeah. very yeah. interesting. You know, it's it's an interesting place to be. And you're you're happy that they're not suffering, that they're yeah. Their minds are whole again, but we're still missing them, even though it wasn't really that. It's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, but no, I can empathize completely. It's, a, you know, it, it is that grieving process and you, you, you're you missing some little things. But, um, you know, my mum would say sometimes, like, for example, my wife and I are having a baby next month, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Hopefully. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it doesn't come earlier than in a few weeks because we're also moving house, so we're pretty busy. Um, and yeah um my mum was saying oh you know i just wish you'd have been here to to see you know your baby and, and i said but you know look like we've got to accept that it might be nice in that moment but she wouldn't remember who the baby was or or you know um or anything like that and she would forget straight away after anyway so you can't beat yourself up about it and you know but you know deep down we also know that we like I said in the book and what I want to get across to children and young people is that, you know, people are impacted by dementia in many different ways. Um, 
but you know deep down there's still a, a loving person there it, dementia is like a mask that you know changes that person in different ways but there's still a person behind that and a person that deserves to be loved and a person that loves you as well and that's what I really want to really want to get across because that's the bond that I always had um, with my grandma no, no matter what so and it can be hard to remember that my mom got very combative and hostile she was she was very good at scratching and clawing people and drawing right. blood and the care staff they just took it but i would not let her do that to me it was like i would just grab her wrist and like oh no you're not doing that to me yeah and you know and it's like i don't want to be doing this with my mother <laughs> it's like no. it's it was hard but i also wasn't going to let her hurt me that was my husband's last interaction with her she was refusing to get off the x-ray table at the doctor's office yeah and she was causing a fuss and he was always so good at sweet talking her into whatever so he came over it's just like literally five or six minutes from where we live and he he tried real hard to sweet talk her but man she was just having ornery that day and <laughs> she just refused to get off the table and he reached out his hands like come on mom and she just <sighs> raked his hand and and oh it was terrible i mean it's like a cat yeah and yeah. he's like she was well she was originally five four but as she aged she shrunk up some and he's six three and so he finally oh. just like literally picked her up and plunked her into the wheelchair he was so angry yeah and it's yeah, tough it's tough isn't it yeah well and he feels badly because that was his last interaction he didn't see her before she died because the last two weeks before she died the care home was closed to to family and visitors and all that they did yeah. let us in the day before and the day of although yeah. the poor executive director <laughs> it was me and my husband, my sister, my well, my sister and her family. So for them, my daughter, her fiance, one of my mom's brothers and her sister. So there end up 10 of us Wow! all at once. I mean, we, my sister and I don't live that far apart. My daughter's down the road, but the fact that we all managed to like coalesce outside mom's room, all within the same, like 10 minute time frame. Yeah. That's incredible. Poor, yeah. And the poor executive director, he's like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please but, leave. And he didn't yeah. want to tell us to leave, but he yeah. also didn't want us to stay. And yeah, you know, he was part of the care team. It's like he knew he could rely on me to do what needed to be done. And yeah. I knew he had all of our best interests at heart and that he was always in a difficult place. So I always tell people, you know, your responsibilities as a caregiver don't end when you put them in a care residence. No, it allows you to go back a lot to the relationship you had before either spouse or daughter yeah. grandson but there's still a lot of things you have to deal with and take care so of because so much i mean i haven't found a place that's going to do all of it for you so and no, i don't no. think most of us could afford that if that was the case no and then no, i was going to no. go back to the two-year-old i'm i'm just like imagining this two-year-old whose grandfather's got early onset dementia or alzheimer's yeah. Can you imagine what that kid, like their understanding, like they might be the person to find the cure or, yeah. or yeah. who knows what, just, just that familiarity and that comfortableness with grandpa because of, of his experiences, but because you made it a little easier for his mom with your book. I'm just like, that's going to yeah. play in the back of my mind the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. F fingers crossed. But that said that hopefully the book starts that conversation and you know, um, this is my grandma's experience and I want it to represent as many people living with dementia as possible. And in the book, it meant it, 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 the illustrations show different forms of dementia, but obviously in a very short space, it can't cover everything. So it's just an introduction and it, and it wants, I really want it to start that conversation, you know, the, the children with the parents or the, the teachers, whoever, or the carers, whoever it may be to say, oh, well, why is that there? Or why is that slipper missing? Or you know, why, why is, why is the gla grandma's glasses over there and not on her head? And why is she asking multiple times the same questions or, uh, you know, the, the clock's just gone past like a tiny part. So, so why is, why is she asking the same question again? Things like that. So I really wanted to start that conversation. Yeah. The only other children's book I'm familiar with comes at it. This um, woman's mom had earlier onset Alzheimer's and right. She was late to motherhood, which sounds 
kind of like, I don't know, I don't like that phrase, but whatever. And she would bring the kids to visit with mom. And her way of explaining it was that there were weeds in Nana's garden. And she used that analogy. And I thought that was really cool too, because that's kind of a, it's a visualization. I think you can kind of visualize the garden as the brain and the weeds. And that's a little bit, a little bit higher, higher brow than a two-year-old probably can get. Although not as that sounds like a pretty with it two-year-old. Yeah. 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 No, no, it was very, it was really cool. Really cool. But yeah, I think just going back to with the care homes, uh, just, just, so I like, like I say, someone said to me um, about care homes in their opinion are like jails. And, and I just thought, well, really tough thing to say that to someone whose family member had lived in a care home because my mum, I remember, struggled probably till the day my grandma passed away. My, my mum still struggled with guilt of, of putting my grandma in a care home, but then the guilt faded after we found just how positive the impact was of my grandma living there. It was, she lived the best time of her life there. And I just thought, yeah, I mean, I get why some people consider them in that way. Some people have horrendous experiences. Again, we were very, very lucky. Um, but yeah, I just think, you know, you, people shouldn't be made to feel guilty for, for that process because like you say, even when um, a family member is, is supported in, in supported living or in a care home, that doesn't just take away the responsibility from the family or the, the, the primary carer. My mum was up at the care home for an hour at least every day still. Um, and, she, and then she'd spend time with other residents and do everything. So yeah. And like you say, she was running around doing stuff and getting bits. If there was hospital visits, you know, that was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Trying losing things. She used to come home uh, with with catheters st- still in her arm, all sorts of things. And my mum would be up like sorting it out. Um, that's hospital's fault. But anyway, yeah, that's a side story. But um not really, really glad that she didn't have to go into a hospital at the end as well, because you know, um, she, it was a lovely, peaceful setting and my mum was there and it was like midnight and it was so weird. I, I woke up in the middle of the night with this vision of my grandma in my head and I just knew like it was just this vision of a wave and it was so strange, but, uh, and it was just literally about midnight. I woke up and then my mum came home and in the early hours and said she passed at midnight and, uh, yeah, it was pretty, really peaceful, really peaceful, really lucky. Yeah. And it's, I've dealt with caregivers that where the end is just so stressful for them. Yeah. yeah. And you know, they don't call hospice in early enough. They haven't had palliative care early enough or at all. It's just, there's a lot of ways to get help. And that's one of the things that I've, I am trying to share. Every time I learn a little bit of knowledge, I find somebody to talk about it. so that <laughs> yeah. Other people can learn because I, I've still learned. It's been almost a year since my mom passed away and I'm still learning new things. And there are days when I think, man, I really wish I'd known this earlier. Yeah. Wow, that would have been nice to know that two or three years <laughs> ago, but that's okay. I'll just share it with everybody else so other people can bypass having that feeling. But yeah, my mom, because she broke her leg, she was mostly asleep. I think she just fell asleep and didn't wake back up mm-hmm. because when I was there the day before, it was about, about 26 hours before she died, that yeah. um, she wasn't awake. She wasn't conscious. Yeah. And so I think she just slowly, <clears throat> excuse me, slipped away. Yeah. And that's fine because I you know and it's the, the very, very end, if they get all the way to the end, sometimes, you know, they forget how to eat and they, they yeah. literally curl in on themselves and become just like locked into this shell of a body. And it's like, Oh, it's not pretty. No, not so, yeah, so I'm, no. I'm glad my mom skipped that stage and your grandma skipped that stage. And I've got yeah. other people I know whose loved ones, something happened and, it's whew, it's definitely a, a blessing for them as well as us. But um, yeah, yeah, and yeah, definitely because you know my grandma would forget. Uh, she, we could see she was forgetting to swallow over the past couple of years or so, and uh, especially when she'd go into hospital with something that would get worse. And um, so yeah, and I remember a doctor telling me a couple of years ago when when people with dementia forget to sw- swallow, then that's sort of the end of the road. And I was like, well. Wow you're telling me that she's going to pass away soon. And he was basically saying, yeah. And obviously that was two years ago. So we're really lucky that it did, that didn't happen. But at the same time, we're just really glad it didn't get worse. Like you say. So, um, so yeah. How did you guys handle her not remembering to swallow? Cause I see that a lot. People are saying, you know, well, 
they they chipmunk their food by you know sticking it in their cheeks and not swallowing and that's obviously a difficult thing to do you know yeah, get she, somebody to swallow yeah i mean uh, the book shows it slightly um in the differences between a beforehand and uh after sort of towards the end of her life but um she lost a lot of weight uh, in turn so because she would eat, eat much smaller amounts and she would just eat slowly so like she would eat and then hold it in her mouth and then for a few more seconds and then you could see she was sort of think and then eventually it like if she was drinking she would do it for a while do this moving her head around and then swallow and it would take a few seconds uh, each time so um yeah, uh, she would, she would, yeah, it would just took a bit of time. So it was basically just allowing the, the very slow processing of the eating to happen yeah. in her mind. So it's like an that's old, it. old computer that's barely working. <laughs> yeah. I've made that analogy before because I think a lot of people can understand, you know, it just, it takes so much more effort for their brain to process what we don't even think about. Like, you know, well, we all should maybe pay a little more attention when we're eating so we don't eat too much, but <laughs> yeah. that's a different side of that coin. But yeah, yeah, you need to understand what's going on in their brain, but you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So do you want to read us some of the book? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. And I'm going to post some of the pictures from the book in the show notes. So you guys can see them. The illustrations are fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're fun. They're very colorful. They're kind of joyful considering the topic. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, in, I mean, the next book that I'm going to do um, after this, uh, that's in, in, coming out in a couple of months, because this is going to be this is the start of a series of different long term health conditions. Uh, like I've done one on cancer and on other books, and the next one is going to be on depression. And this, this, I'm actually really looking forward to how we make that child friendly. And um, yeah, it's going to be a real tough challenge, but interesting. The same with this. So the, the, my favorite scene in this book, for example, is the care home scene because it's so bright and busy. And, and somebody said to me, someone had looked at the book and said, you know, the person that said, I feel like care homes are like jails. And they said, you know, it doesn't, it, it's a bit too happy of a place for me. Like, I, but I sort of said, I, I understand, you know, your experiences. Ours were very positive with my grandma, very, very lucky. But then at the same time, we don't want to, for me, they don't want to be, we don't want to be telling children and young people, look, care homes are horrendous, terrible places, never go there. The people living in them are, you know, you don't want to go near them. We don't want to scare children away from that. We want to invite them in. So it's definitely my favorite scene because it's got a lot of little hidden things in there. Um, you've got, you've got children in there with different disabilities um, in the background as well. Just nice hidden little messages for me that make it, much more inclusive and diverse uh, and I'm really excited uh, and about that. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. That'll be great. I, I totally agree with you that children need to be a part of the care home community. My mom's resident was across the street from what we call in the States a middle school. So it's like yeah. um, the sixth, seventh and eighth year of school. Yeah. My daughter's been out of school a while. I had to think about that one. <laughs> and they had clubs that would come over and do activities. There was also this community that mom lived in was assisted living. So it was for retirees that maybe right. needed, well, if you're smart, you realize if I move into one of these places, somebody's doing the cooking, the cleaning, you know, the, the maintenance of the yard and I don't have to worry about, you know, they're, ma they're managing my medications. I don't have to worry about this stuff. I can just enjoy my, my retirement years, but yeah. they would, the kids would come from the school and do, they would entertain, they would do activities, they would play games and the care staff would bring over the memory care residents who were like, my mom went over in the early couple of first couple of years she lived there because she, she could participate a little bit. You know, she, yeah. she could benefit from it and being a grandma of three, she really enjoyed. I mean, just even if she just sat there and watched the kids bustle about and do their thing, she yeah. really enjoyed it. So yeah, There's we definitely need, for it. yeah, we need to make yeah. sure people understand that there are a lot of positive things that those of us in the community can do for mm. people living in those kinds of residences. I had, a, a, I always took out, I don't think I ever took them together. 
but mom and other Diane. And at one, we went, we'd go to the park and watch kids. The three of us, and people thought yeah. I was crazy. They're like, I can't believe you're taking two women with Alzheimer's out of the care home. I'm like, <laughs> they talk to each other. I don't have to listen to the insane <laughs> babble all the time. It keeps me from wanting to drive off the cliff. You know, it's like, and then once I showed up to take my mom to the manicurist and she said, oh, well, can my friend, this would be other, other Diane come along. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. What the heck? And the care staff was so familiar with my routine and taking the, you know, my mom out that they're like, oh yeah, sure. You could take her out. Oh wait, we should probably call her family. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was just, it was just, they, they trusted me. They knew that it would all be fine, but then they realized, oh, you know, maybe uh, we should kind of like alert the family and make sure they're fine with it. Yeah, yeah. And so I had the two ladies at the nail shop getting their nails done and they would talk to each other and it just, it made it so much easier and they were happy. And, you know, it was like a, a ladies afternoon out. I mean, it, you know, yeah. yes, you had to supervise and make sure they didn't trip over you know, anything in the parking lot, car park or whatever, you know, but yeah. they dealt with each other. So I just had to kind of ma manage them. So it really wasn't that I didn't think it was that big a deal. Yeah. No, that so. sounds just like what my mom used to do at the care home. She did the same thing, but, yeah, my grandma had some good friends there and friends that she'd known for years before that she worked with in, in the Heinz factory in Wigan and stuff. And yeah, which was, which was really cool. Um, and yeah, they nearly got me on, on the weekend. Actually, we did a live reading for them. Um, my, because my, my nonprofit organization, we, we deliver training around disability awareness as I said before called happy smiles training CIC. And, um, we're going to do some intergenerational reading work with the book between primary school children and, um, and care home residents. So we practiced it at the weekend with um, my grandma's care home and did a reading of the book to them, which was amazing. And all the ladies were sat there and, but they nearly got me with, they um, started to sing um, for she was a jolly good fellow. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to have to, I was like, right, I'm going to stop reading. I'm going to take a drink because I'm going to go. <laughs> That's so yeah. sweet. Yeah. My mom was really supportive of the other residents it was always kind of an internal chuckle because she she walked just fine until she broke her leg. Mm -hmm. And many of them used walkers or I think you guys call yeah, them yeah. braces, right? Yeah, KK and, walkers and I know what you mean. Okay. And so yeah. she'd be, you know, she'd have her head popped out her the door of her room and she'd be like, if you need any help, just let me know. And I would just <laughs> be like, lady, you can barely help yourself. You know? <laughs> but but that's what made her happy. She was yeah part of a women's um, service organization and, you know, a mom and a grandma and she helped my dad with his businesses and all that. Yeah. So it's like, she was a caregiver. She took care of her mom a little bit. Sure. Her sister did most of that, but you know, my mom participated somewhat, not as much as she probably would have wanted to, but a lot of that was because her mind was already going bad. Yeah. So that's just who she was. And, you know, yeah, yeah it made me kind of laugh inside that she's offering these people help and, you know, she couldn't help herself. But, <laughs> you know, and it's there. I find I found in her care home that all of the residents accepted each other for, for the most part. There were some, you know, personality differences and some people that were a little bit, you know, their personalities were a little rougher. Yeah. The saddest thing was other Diane got really paranoid. I showed up one day and she literally had all of her laundry in her lap and she's just yeah. clutching it. I've and, seen that. Yeah. And I said, I said, who the heck just dumped your laundry in your lap like that? Would you like me to help you? And I lean in to like pick up the laundry. I was just going to go set it in her room. And she jerked back like I was going to slap her upside the head. And I was like, yeah. okay, fine. And it was about that point that I noticed my mom was spending less time with other Diane and more time with other, other. Diane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's and yeah, it was kind of crazy, but the, the other sad thing was that the other Diane, the second one got, she progressed faster than my mom. Right. So she just, I mean, she totally forgot who I was. She didn't even recognize me. She stopped acknowledging me. It was really kind of sad because I'd show up and she'd be like, 
I think I must know you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm here all the time. You know, we do yeah. stuff together. She, no, I think you're. And then she'd fill in, you know, I think you're so-and-so or I think <laughs> yeah. you're the nurse or what. I'm like, whatever. Yeah. I don't care what you think, who I am, yeah. Yeah. you know. And it it was just kind of sad. But, yeah, my mom had friends and yeah. activities. And I knew the reason I chose a care home for her, one, my daughter had just moved out. I'm like, I'm not, I haven't even had a month without somebody else that I have to deal with. Yeah. And I'm not ready to do that at 50, you know, and I sincerely thought that she could easily live 10 or 15 years. And I really wasn't interested in giving up 10 or 15 years of my life, yeah. you know, because we never know what'll happen. I mean, that was in 2017 and then look what happened last year. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I also knew that once she was there and she got acclimated and I could see that there was activities and, and, friends and just it's like there was people that accepted her and her stupid story about the dogs <laughs> which she had a story that she told all the time like i've had dogs all my life is how it started and i usually figured out a way of distracting her as soon as i could almost tell when that story was coming yeah but and i've i've said this before on the podcast but she told that story so often one day other diane said slapped her knee and said you've told me that story 803 times. And I'm thinking <laughs> 803 is a fairly specific number, probably yeah. true. <laughs> and thankfully that like distracted my mom. And I think my mom was like kind of taken aback and a little startled because yeah. that was the expression she had on her face. So thankfully we didn't have to hear it again that day. And then like <laughs> a couple months later, we were sitting outside in their courtyard, which was beautiful. And my mom starts in on this story. And the next thing I know, other Diane is parroting my mom. And I thought that is elder abuse. You have programmed <laughs> your friend with this story. This friend who has Alzheimer's can now repeat this story that you repeat all the time. This is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was so like bizarre that this other yeah. woman could literally parrot the story. And I thought, yeah. You can't remember my name, but you can remember <laughs> this whole story. I'm like, I'm not even sure. I want to know how many times my mom has said that, but no. she didn't get frustrated with my mom or, you know, when she said that you've told me this 103 or 803 times, it wasn't frustration. It was more like a statement. Like you've told me that story so many times, but tell me again. You know? Yeah. It was yeah, just yeah. Like, you know, and well, I had to like, you know, distract her. Cause I'm like, if I hear that story one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah. Well, you come up with those little, you know, those little uh, coping techniques and man mechanisms and ways. Yeah. I guess you just come up with that in, in the best, least, uh, yeah, least restrictive way. So um, yeah. My grandma used to say every day, for example, or multiple, multiple times a day, her favorite words was uh, I'm befuddled. And she'd say, oh, oh, I'm befuddled. And that meant she was confused and feeling confused. And we learned that. And, uh, in fact, I'm actually using the words. I'm, I'm going to use that um, those words to inspire another project that I'm working on um, around supporting caregivers, um, so unpaid and paid caregivers, and trying to highlight positive examples of that. So that's something I'm working on, which I'm really excited about uh, to try to support them because I've just seen it with my grandma's care home, with my mom, both unpaid and paid carers. You know, don't get enough recognition for everything that they do. So that's some, another project that I'm working on. So I'll keep you updated about that too. I'm really excited about that. That'll be cool. Okay. Yeah. So read us a little bit of your book and you can yeah, show sure. the pictures if you want. Cause we do, we do share the video. Oh, uh, I would, do you know what? Um, I could give you a copy, but if you commit, let me share the screen. I'll be able to share it if you can do that. All right. So hopefully you can see that screen mm -hmm. there. Um, okay. My grandma has dementia, but what does that word mean? Let's talk it through together. Come along, I'll set the scene. I love days at my grandma's, baking cakes with a smile. We would listen to her tales that would often last a while. Then we started to notice that grandma forgot each day. So we went to the doctor to see what she had to say. It's dementia, said the doctor. That word made me feel scared. She explained it very clearly so that we felt prepared. The cells inside grandma's brain will struggle to work as well. Medicine can slow this down, by how much it's hard to tell. There are many types of dementia, Alzheimer's being just one. It mostly happens to older people 
but not to everyone. And this, that's where um, I guess we got the opportunity to try and represent some of those different characters in there too as well um, at the, that last bit. And um, yeah, as some other examples, um, when I was talking about the, the, little, the little things the illustrator's done, so you'll see the number 82 on the gate there in the house. Um, that's the number of my grandma's house that she lived at. Um, and there's some really cool little subtle touches throughout throughout as well. We, her house was always super messy. We used to mess her house up so much, so you see it in there. Um, and she just didn't care. She just let us do whatever, and it was amazing. Um, but then hopefully for children, as they flick through the book from this page, for example, where you've got a clearer but slightly messy kitchen, but then it goes to, you know, you'll see some of the plants dying and, and some of the, the cleaning equipment that are out and glasses missing, you know, the, the, the hobs on and the, the pans burning. So things like that. Hopefully children will pick up on that and say, why is that happening? You know, having those conversations. So I suppose a, a preview of it there. That's awesome. And like I said, it's really colorful and yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, yeah. um, yeah. it's very uh, inclusive, which is a big deal these days. <laughs> I was really excited about that. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very big on, on sort of inclusion, diversity, and I wanted to have as diverse and inclusive a range of characters as possible. So wherever we got the opportunity, and I was speaking to some dementia specialists in the UK who are doctors and uh, female, female doctors, and uh, one of them said to me, like, I read through your book, and the first thing that struck me personally was that um, as a researcher and um, as an expert and, and a doctor, she said that when people talk about doctors, you just think white man in a quote, whereas we're wanting to completely reverse that. And, you know, it's all just about getting children to think that little bit differently. And if people, if children are um, made aware of different people, differences in people and in individuals in all these different ways, disability, race, gender, everything, then, you know, will be a more inclusive and diverse and better culture and better society for it. So that's the end. I totally agree. So how many books do you think are going to be in this series that you've started? Uh, well, six this year, including, including the dementia one. So uh, yeah, six wow. this year. Yeah. So you're almost done with the second one, which you said was on depression. Yeah. So you have four more to go. That's not yeah, too yeah. bad. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got some drafts already written with different people. Like every book's based on, obviously people with lived experience of that condition and, and different people. So I'm just consulting a few different people at the moment around the depression book. Uh, but yeah, I've got a few more in the pipeline as well. And I'm just trying to keep maybe one slot clear for something special that comes up. We'll see. That makes sense. <laughs> and so do you know if the baby's a boy or a girl, or are you waiting to find out next month? It's going to be a surprise. So yeah. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, going to be one, so or the, one or the other. <laughs> definitely, it's definitely going to be one. I said to my wife, well, I, I can definitely bet that it's going to be one or the other. Definitely. But, um, <laughs> Hopefully not yeah. one of each. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> that would be a surprise. Yeah, that my would wife, be a big surprise. My wife's got a pre pretty big belly on her at the moment from the pregnancy. So like, like she's quite a slim person. So uh, yeah, to go, she's suddenly ballooned and um yeah, hopefully there's not one hiding, another one hiding in there. <laughs> I think they're pretty good at finding that these days, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, we'll I wish see. you well with the books and the yeah. baby and definitely keep me in the loop on what's going on because it's always good to support everybody and that's what I'm here to do. And I really yeah. appreciate you coming on today and sharing your book. Like I said, you guys can go. Alex's Instagram account is hot linked in the show notes. So you can go there and see what he's up to and the pictures of the book. And some of those are also in the show notes. And yeah. I'm sure you're going to definitely want to order one for yourself. That's linked from Amazon. So you can do that too. Yeah. And enjoy it yourself with your kids or grandkids or give it as a gift. Yeah, definitely. Please do. And you know, the more we talk about it, the more we raise the awareness the more, the more we can talk about this book and get it out there, the more it's going to help people. So, um, you know, not only are donations going to nonprofit organizations, charities, but you know, it's, it's the more we can do it, the more we can raise that awareness. I'm really passionate about that. And yeah, just hopefully if people can buy it on Amazon and some people want tried to get it on .co.uk. So I guess make sure they go to amazon.com for, yeah. for people living outside the UK, but uh, please leave a review and please get in touch and let me know. Honestly, Make, if someone buys the book, especially someone in, in America, you know, um, and they get in touch and like, I've read this, your book, it's like, wow. So please let me know if you read the book and tell me what you think. 
Awesome. Well, I hope that you have lots and lots of sales because it's an important <laughs> topic. Thanks, Jennifer. Me too. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.